This week, Chris Cleveland from Pixum joins us to discuss using computer vision to combat phishing. Jeff Foley joins us for an interview on the OWASP AMAS project. In the enterprise security news, Okta acquires Auth0, Nobefore acquires MediaPro, PayPal to acquire Curve, and Dropbox to acquire DocSend. Aqua Security raises $135 million, Privacera secures a Series B, YL Ventures sells stake in Exonius, Sneak secures a Series E, and McAfee sells its enterprise security business. AWS announces new lower-cost storage, Radware's new integrated application delivery and protection, Bitdefender launches cloud-based EDR solution, Awake's NDR platform CrowdStrike Falcon improves the SOC efficiency, Tufin releases vulnerability-based change automation. Gigamon launches Hawk. Sonotype releases a new Nexus firewall policy to secure the software supply chain. And even more on top of all of that. Stay tuned to this edition of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. JumpCloud offers a cloud directory platform that gives users a single identity for their email, apps, network, and work device. Whether Mac, Windows, or Linux, JumpCloud gives IT admins a single pane of glass to configure and secure those devices. With JumpCloud, remote onboarding and offboarding goes from hours to under five minutes and puts zero trust security within reach for organizations of any size. Looking for a directory that supports heterogeneous OSs or you need just SSO, MDM, LDAP, or MFA? JumpCloud will make your job easier. Try it out for yourself at securityweekly.com forward slash jumpcloud. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly, episode 219 for March 10th, 2021. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined remotely by Adrian Sanabria. Adrian, welcome. Hey, thanks. Uh, looking forward to our four-hour uh, news segment coming up later. <laughs> there's a lot. I didn't know how, but there's a lot of news to cover here to help us with that. And of course, with the entire show, Mr. Tyler Shields is here with us. Tyler, welcome. Good afternoon, super host indeed. Looking looking forward to all those news pieces. Absolutely. Before we dive into it, if you've got a specific guest or topic that you'd like us to cover on one of the upcoming shows, submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guest. Complete that form. We review those on a regular basis uh, and we'll get back to everyone that does that. Joining us today is Chris Cleveland, the CEO and founder of Pixum, to talk about making the web more trustworthy by combating uh, phishing. Uh, the landing page uh, for the sponsored interview can be found at securityweekly.com forward slash Pixum. Chris, welcome to the show. Paul, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. It is, uh, it is nice to have you on the show today. Always happy to talk about uh, phishing. Uh, not happy that phishing is usually wildly successful. Well, unless they're running Pixum, of course, and we're going to dig into why that why that is the case. Um, Chris, start off by telling us a little bit about your background and how you came to uh, be the founder of uh, Pixum. Well, uh, I actually don't come from a traditional cyber background. I was a graduate student at Columbia studying computer vision and machine learning applications in cybersecurity. And I stumbled into applications of computer vision in phishing in particular. And this was at a time when computer vision algorithms were becoming much better due to innovations in convolutional network or what we commonly call deep learning technology these days. Um, but I won a pitch contest. I bought a, a ticket to Black Hat. I spent about three hours on the expo floor talking to every single vendor about what they were doing about phishing. And it turned out that they were putting yellow tape around a crime scene, but they weren't actually solving the crime to begin with. So that was really where I spotted the opportunity and how the company got kicked off. Chris, what is what, what is computer vision? How would you describe it? Computer vision is software that can see. Uh, so if you think about humans and animals, we have light that hits our retina and our brains interprets objects in the world. But it turns out that an image uh, just consists of a bunch of pixels and using algorithms and basic number crunching, you can actually create algorithms that do the same thing. Um, so you see a lot of computer vision today for radiologists trying to interpret medical images. Mm -hmm. You see it at companies like Tesla that are creating autonomous driving cars. Uh, for Pixim, we're trying to stop phishing in the browser at point of click in real time. 
Uh, so that's kind of a high level description. It's really software that can see just like people can see. What's the, I mean, obviously there's a lot of anti-phishing solutions, I guess I'll call them. Email security is probably a better term for it, but what are, like, why would you do that in the browser versus on the email gateway all the way through the email client or cloud hosted email provider? Absolutely. So, you know, Pixum detects and stops phishing attacks at point of click in the browser with real-time computer vision, like you said. And because we detect attacks there, we have a lot of unique opportunities to see what the gaps are in traditional security protection. So for example, uh, in our breach data, 51% of the breaches that we detected and stopped were social media based. So that means they're delivered through personal email or they're delivered through the Facebook platform themselves or maybe other things like WhatsApp. So over half of the attacks that we stop are actually completely outside the scope of enterprise security protection. Um, and oh. moreover, like just thinking about the work from home uh, mm. situation right now, 18%, uh, almost one fifth of the breaches that we detected and stopped on personal devices were actually Office 365 or work related. So I'd say those are a couple of the big gaps. Uh, of course, there's a number of other ones. I mean, I think a lot of your viewers know that it's very easy for uh, hackers to incorporate stealthy tactics. So if I host a phishing web page, it's very easy for me to redirect the incoming request depending on the request time and the request origin. Um, but if you're able to detect and stop phishing attacks at real time at point of click in the browser, there's really no way to get around that. Uh, all roads lead to the browser. So that's why we put our solution there. Yeah, and it's, it's well put, Chris, because that, you know, having spent time years ago doing pen testing and talking to my pen tester friends, I mean, you're basically just, you're as an attacker, you're going around what protections you either know or believe to be in place. And so that is, well, I know they've got great email, you know, phishing protection. So I'm going to get that link in there some other way. And if their corporate inbox is highly protected, I'm going to use some uh, open source intelligence gathering. I'm going to figure out what their personal address is. And I'm going to go after them at home or on their personal device or personal account. And I think yeah. that the example for me, um, when my reading of many books uh, in cybersecurity and cybercrime and nation state attacks, the DNC hack in 2016 was the one where they went after the person at the DNC. You know the story better than I do, Chris. Uh, they went after the person's personal email account first, correct? That's right. And this was a case when uh, phishing really uh, influenced the course of history. Um, you know, in that instance, the head of Hillary Clinton's campaign was targeted on his personal email. And I believe actually the email was placed in a quarantine and he was advised by a colleague of his to take it out. Um, and he entered in his credentials. I think it was, it was saying, Hey, somebody from Ukraine has, uh, accessed your password. You need to change, you need to change your password right now. Um, and he opened the, the link and entered his password and the rest of history, the mm. emails and communications with the presidential candidate were stolen and then leaked out at strategic times. Um, so, you know, that's, that was really an eye opener for me, at least when I realized, you know, this isn't a problem just for my grandparents and people who are less tech savvy. It really impacts, uh, political organizations, presidential candidates, fortune 50 companies. Sure. So, Tyler? so yeah, yeah. The, um, what's interesting to me here is that. Whenever anybody's hears phishing, and it just happened to us, right? When you hear phishing, you think email. But really, it's a much broader problem. Because when you think of phishing, email-based phishing, tokenization, ML, AI-based um, models that tokenize the text and can analyze the text of an inbound fish, fish in the sense of an email fish, do a fairly effective job. But what you're doing to add value beyond that and to do something very different is to go and look at other things that are not necessarily just that standard entry model. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you look at a phishing attack anatomy, uh, you can focus on what's going on on the back end behind the scenes, or you can focus on what the end user is actually seeing and experiencing in their browser. And we're really doing the second thing. If you focus on the HTML, for example, there's an infinite number of HTML packages that can produce a visually trustworthy impression to an end user. So you're kind of in this, you know, cat and mouse adversarial cat and mouse game where you can never quite catch up. We really like focusing on what the end user is experiencing because you're really working backwards from a hacker success category. You need to make something that's compelling to an end user that they click and that looks trustworthy. So we feel like if we our software can identify anything that looks trustworthy to an end user you can really start to uh moving towards a more complete uh, solution where it's impossible for adversaries to get around 
And is this run then primarily on client side and primarily in the in the uh, you know on the endpoint? Yeah, I mean it's it's point of click in the browser. So we actually work as a browser extension solution. So we run in all the major browsers, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, any Chromium based browser. Um, that's really where the problem lives, and that's where we deliver the solution. Yeah, because it doesn't really matter the delivery technique, whether it's social media or coming in across um, email or any other method. Really, what they do is they always drive you to a website. Exactly. Um, you know, like I had mentioned, over 50% of the attacks that we stopped were social media based. So they weren't even coming in through uh, enterprise email. All roads lead to the browser. That's why we like to solve this problem in the browser. And does this also apply to mobile as well, Chris? Uh, today, our solution's desktop. Uh, Q3, Q4 of this year, we're going to have releases in Android and iOS because phishing activity in mobile is certainly through the roof. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, uh, for the enterprise, I think the desktop protection is really is key, right? But And we have a big focus on delivery to personal devices as well. So you can roll out our solution to all of your work devices using something like group policy or SCCM, but you can just as e easily invite end users to install and enroll this on their personal devices with a one-time password. It's super fast. It's like one click and then a one-time password and you're enrolled on your personal device. And do you find that enterprises have kind of an evangelism campaign to go, hey, like this is a perk, you should protect your personal devices too, not just to protect the business data, but also this helps protect people at home from succumbing to phishing scams that may be after their personal accounts, not even just their work accounts. Yeah, and I mean, I think the pandemic has been a wake-up call for that. Uh, a lot of studies indicate that in the new normal after the pandemic, most employees are going to work from home at least, uh, or I think a third of employees are going to be working from home at least twice a week. So this isn't something that's going away. So we definitely make it easy for enterprises to do that, uh, essentially with an invitation email. Uh, because this is a browser extension, you can literally go to our website and install it on your device with a single click. And from there, you can register your uh, extension using your corporate email. And if it's a valid corporate email with an enterprise account, then right away uh, you're registered, you're connected to your IT and security stakeholders, and you can get that protection. And so, Chris, you're not analyzing the HTML and JavaScript. You're visually looking at the page, correct? Because there's a lot of tricks you can play with HTML and JavaScript for sure. That's exactly right. And it goes back to your first question, what is computer vision? Computer vision is software that can see just like people can see. And, uh, you know, like Tyler was saying, if you're looking at the HTML and I'm a hacker, I can make so many different HTML packages that'll produce a visually identical or a visually compelling screenshot that deceives an end user. So by focusing on what the end user is actually seeing and what they're opening in their browser, we're trying to make it impossible for hackers to evade detection and deceive end users. Chris, what's the probability that as an attacker, I can present a, a phishing page that's collecting credentials that looks exactly like the real page and try and fool your computer vision? Uh, it's going to be pretty hard to do that with uh, a visual duplicate because we're not just looking for changes uh, from the original. We're going to detect things that look like a carbon copy, or we're going to detect things that look a little bit different from a carbon copy, but still look visually compelling. Um, what we're really making sure of is that there's that alignment so that if you have something that looks like a PayPal or a Bank of America, Facebook, an Outlook phishing attack, and it's not on a domain that's authorized by those brands, we can alert the end user in real time. Mm -hmm. So those can look like carbon copies. They can be literal visual duplicates. Those are actually the easiest for us to detect. Or you can make perturbations or you can make changes uh, to try and get around our algorithms, but it's going to be very difficult for uh, hackers to do that. That's awesome. That's awesome. So actually, I, I have a Good question time. for you. Go. Uh, um, I want to go back to your, how you started it. You you came from a non-security background, which is super cool to me to see a mm -hmm. crossover from. Like I always find value when somebody that's not security related decides to apply their knowledge and their expertise into the security community. That's where innovation occurs. And so it's really cool that you came in. But tell me a little bit, what was your first thought going to your first Black Hat cold, having never been there, not having a security background? Um, it was definitely a learning experience. You know, like I said, I was uh, in a research class. I had exhausted my graduate school curriculums. Like there were all these classes in deep learning and computer vision. And I was in a research class that was really looking at different applications. And security, cybersecurity was really something that I stumbled into. And I wasn't a cyber guy. I didn't have 
I didn't really know a lot about uh, what a traditional uh, practitioner would, would learn in school or in industry, but I knew what fishing was because I'm kind of a regular guy. And I, at first I thought that fishing wasn't really that big a problem, but, you know, we talked about the case with John Podesta um, and, you know, that year there were all of these breaches of fortune, 50 fortune, 500 companies. And when you dug underneath the surface, it turned out that almost all of them started with some kind of credential theft or fishing related breach. Um, you know, coming to Black Hat, it was really uh, an eye opener for me, um, kind of as an industry, industry outsider. Uh, but I really spent the whole day there on the expo floor. And, you know, there were probably, you know, several hundred companies. I talked to every single one of them because almost all of them talked about fishing. It was very clear that fishing was a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but when you dug beneath the surface and you say, hey, so I see that you have phishing in your solution or phishing protection in your solution. It turned out that they were blacklisting IP addresses, blacklisting URLs. They were tuned into various threat feeds. But, you know, a 12 year old can copy and paste some HTML from the Citibank page and host it on a new domain. And there was nothing in that infrastructure that was going to catch it. Um, so I don't know. I looked around at different applications in computer vision and convolutional networks. Like I said, there's a lot going on in medical imaging autonomous driving. There's all kinds of cool applications out there, but this was something that I didn't see a lot of other people doing. And, uh, you know, I'd also just say that I grew up with the internet. I love the internet. I love the World Wide web. Uh, it's just created so many opportunities for so many people, including myself. And, you know, this is in a small way, I feel a way of making the web and the internet itself a little bit more trustworthy. Um, you know, our mission is to stop phishing breaches, but I think the longer term vision is also to make the internet uh, safer and more trustworthy so that people can do business and do transactions without having to always second guess uh, what URL they open. Chris, do you maintain a, a database of what the pages should look like to have a point of comparison? Uh, well, we actually train our convolutional network models on tens of thousands of archived phishing pages, but also on legitimate pages mm -hmm. and hundreds of thousands of just random URLs from the World Wide Web. So the way a lot of this technology works when we talk about machine learning and convolutional networks is you have models that are trained on large numbers of, uh, of examples, in this case, screenshots and images from the World Wide Web. So we train it on legitimate uh, screenshots from the actual web pages. We also train it on, like I said, tens of thousands of archived, archived screenshots from sources like Fish Tank mm -hmm. and other threat intel feeds like that. And we also just have crawlers that are crawling tons of uh, screenshots so our models just know what web pages look like. That's also really important in these kinds of problems. Yeah, no, no shortage of data to feed into that algorithm, right? Tyler? Yeah, so that's super interesting. So like like any other ML AI based system, you have the good, you feed it the good, you feed it the bad, you denote the bad, you become a truth oracle that fits into the, the learning system. Um, what are some of the key things that you can visually see like if i'm thinking about the html you can you can find pretty pretty solid indicators that would indicate that there's a a, a phishing attempt going on when you dig into the html right that's how a human being might do it uh, like a pen tester or a security engineer might do it when analyzing one of these things but how do you do it from a from a visual standpoint what are the key clusters in the ml algorithm that tend to be the the most important uh, feature vectors well, from a computer vision perspective, we're training our software to recognize that recognize things that people uh, trust and see all the time. So if you think about a typical end user that is logging into Outlook or logging into Facebook, there's certain visual indicators on that page that are going to make them uh, trust it. So those tend to be logos. They tend to be branding. So we'll be able to pick up any of those things, whether they look absolutely identical to what's on the legitimate version of the page or whether they're slightly uh, different. As a lot of actual archived phishing pages that we train our algorithms on, um, a lot of those phishing pages are not visually identical, but they're, they're a little bit different. And I think on the HTML side, um, you know, one thing is actually accessing the HTML telemetry itself, because if you're trying to do that from an email server, um, you know, you're gonna get redirected somewhere else. Mm. But all of a sudden when you actually uh, are getting the, what's being loaded into the browser, only then can you actually see what's going on HTML and screenshot included. Um, but even there, you can use basically a carbon copy of HTML from the legitimate uh, website, or you can use um, something a little bit different that's going to get around detection engines that use various HTML-based signatures. So we really focus on things that people uh, see and trust right in front of them, really the pixels uh, that people are, are seeing. So we focus on branding, we focus on logos, we try and make it really hard to bypass our detection capabilities, um, and also things that would uh, at the same time be able to deceive a typical end user. Adrian? Yeah, yeah. So um, 
you know, business customers wanting to use this on their own proprietary websites, I, I, I assume, you know, is, is there a training period there um, where you have them enter their legitimate uh, URLs, domains, uh, sites and things like that? Uh, and then you, you train on that uh, or, or is it uh, quick enough that it's, it's pretty much real time? You just need a, a list of domains from them. There's a bit of a training period just so that you can make sure that detection is very robust so that it can be something that looks like a carbon copy of your domain or it can be something that is, uh, looks a little bit different. But by default, um, you know, you can install our browser extension. You'll be protected across the 100 most commonly fished brands. And of course, on top of that, you can add domains that are important to your organization to protect those as well. And, and business plan wise, you know, are, are you just looking to get, um, you know, you know, hit, hit a network effect here where you've got enough people using it that, you know, you, you can gather a lot of data on at this point? Um, or, or are you actively going after enterprise customers as well? It's both of those things. Fundamentally, our mission is to stop phishing breaches for our customers. So we want to stop data breaches uh, for hospitals, for schools, for all different kinds of organizations. But of course, as we stop breaches and as we start to gather uh, threat intelligence, that itself is also an important part of our, our business. So we want to be uh, the number one uh, source of protection for phishing attacks, but also the centralized platform uh, for threat intelligence. Uh, so that we're one of the first companies to know about a phishing attack when it first exists. Uh, okay, so it helps if consumers, you know, that that's why you make the extension free. That's why it's it's good to get consumers using this. Yeah, because yeah, if you be visually, of browsers. yeah. So Chris, you visually can tell tell us that that page is phishing well before that's going to end up on some kind of URL block list. I would imagine if you were to scrape open sources of URL block list, that data is pretty stale, and probably a lot of them have been taken down by the time you get to it, you're catching that stuff in, in real time and building your own intelligence on it. Yeah, absolutely. And I can tell you, you know, and this really goes back to being in the browser and being able to see what the end user sees. We have, uh, we have cases of uh, phishing URLs that we detect that are clicked by seven different users over a five day period. This actually happened with a phishing attack that was hosted on a Russian server. And as your listeners probably know, the virus toll community has about 80 different detection engines. And we run that URL through mm -hmm. that virus total uh, API at each of those seven clicks. And throughout that five day life cycle, 80 out of 80 virus total detection engines are marking it as clean. Hmm. Um, so I think there's a very large number of phishing attacks that we basically just don't even know about um, because you can't detect them, you can't even see them unless you have telemetry and protection that's based in the browser. And that's what we're trying to deliver. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, games attackers play before you actually end up at a page in the browser. When I've analyzed phishing attacks, there's like the the onion effect where you're kind of unwrapping all of the redirects and JavaScript mm -hmm. and you know all the when obfuscation I, and all that stuff before it actually ends up in the browser. But you're right, Chris. That's where the real attack is happening. Yeah, and, we see and, that. And we, we see that all the time. We see that all the time in our threat feed because we can actually see the HTML and the screenshots of the phishing attacks that get clicked mm -hmm. by our users. So we see those gaps very clearly. And when we try and open those same URLs, when I have an analyst open that URL the same day, it redirects to Netflix or it redirects to a pet food website. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't show them the same page that we see in our threat feed that the actual oh, end user targeted open. We see that all the time. And that's why we see these periods where you have, again, seven users clicking on the same link over a five-day period and nobody in the security community is even aware of it. Mm. Adrian? Yeah, I, I, we, we've seen cases where uh, only if you're coming from certain IPs, you know, maybe it's a geo IP based mm -hmm. or, you know, they're targeting specific people, uh, you know, they, they can actually have the logic in there where, you know, if, if researchers click it, you know, if, if your IP is AWS or something like that, uh, you know, it's, it's non-malicious, you know, and it's, it's different for the actual victims. Uh, but one of the things time. that, yeah. One of the things that I, I, I like about this is, is we've kind of seen uh, other categories come to the same conclusion where um, evasions are just too easy. You know, if, if you're looking at the problem from too far out, you know, like, uh, you know, an example I'm thinking of is, is the, the network based WAF versus RASP, which, you know, uh, RASP is trying to achieve some of the same goals as a web application firewall, uh, but it does it right on the device. Um, so there, there's, it's much more difficult to evade because, you know, at some point that code has to actually run, 
Uh, and if yeah. you're right there at the runtime, which is what RASP stands for, Runtime Application Security Protection, I think something like that. Um, yeah, you can catch it much easier to to, to catch it there, um, you know, than to try and catch it on on the wire before it actually hits the web server. Right. I mean, we really feel like uh, protection in the browser at point of click is checkmate for the adversary. Um, you can only decoy uh, so many different things but when you're actually there in the browser. There's nothing left for you to do. I know exactly what you're talking about with having AWS or Azure security infrastructure sending requests out to phishing pages and you see something entirely different from what ends up there in the browser. So we're really trying to um, we're really trying to reverse engineer this from an adversary's perspective and make it impossible for them to uh, get by, evade detection, and also deceive an end user. Chris, yeah. you also have a, a threat report uh, that came out Q4 last year that you've analyzed a, a bunch of the data that you've been collecting. Uh, tell us a little bit about that threat report and where people can find it. Uh, it should be linked to actually uh, underneath the video, but if you go to our website, uh, pixum.net, you can download the threat report there. The headline is that over half of the breaches that we prevent are social media based. So that means that any kind of enterprise uh, protection is not going to be able to detect them just because the phishing attacks aren't being delivered through uh, corporate email. They're being delivered through Gmail, personal email, and social media platforms themselves. Uh, we also found that almost one fifth of phishing attacks that we detected and stopped on personal devices were work-related, Office 365 or some kind of Microsoft phishing attack. Many of these were actually uh, spear phishing attacks that were targeting employees at mm. aerospace companies, pharmaceuticals, uh, news companies, you name it. Um, we're seeing a huge amount of uh, activity also targeting people working from home. So I'd say those are some of the key highlights. And also the example I mentioned to you before, you know, we had a phishing attack that was hosted on a Russian server. It got clicked by seven distinct users over a five-day period, uh, during which time the entire virus total community, 80 out of 80 detection engines, marked it as, as clean. Um, so this really is just trying to motivate why you need to be there in the browser protecting end users. Did Kaspersky mark it as clean? Yep. <laughs> yeah, they would be one of those 80, so... <laughs> That's a great so, question, actually. I didn't, yeah, I didn't even consider that, but they definitely, uh, you know, they're in that list. I, I can confirm that after the call. But of course, there's depending on when you you submit a URL, you get anywhere between eighty and eighty five different vendors in there. So I'll have to double check on Kaspersky, but I think that they did. I just, I think that's, you know, I'm not implying, but, I'm not I, implying I mean, anything there. Just of course we, Kaspersky, we, if you're listening, but. But I mean, you know, I'm sure it's still the case today, but, you know, I, I think even, you know, 12, definitely over a decade ago, you know, we knew attackers had their own equivalent of virus total where they would take, you know, popular antiviruses, you know, set them up, you know, yeah. uh, you know, with a nice service where you can upload your, your malware that you're working on and, and see what see what triggers. Yeah, it kind of gives your adversary access to your detection suite or whatever tools that you tools that you have. So it's a tricky game. Mm. Yeah, so it's not terribly surprising you you would see that you know because uh, some of these you know career folks you know the more sophisticated folks they they know before they send it out there their campaign out there they're not going to waste their time they 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 yeah. know it's the AV is going to miss it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the uh, opportunity is there. You can always uh, test your your threat against all the different protection tools. Um, in this particular case, we see this five day lapse period. So, you know, I'm not sure if that's an indictment against Virus Total by, by any means, but it's just a sense that there's really no vendors out there that have the kind of browser based telemetry uh, that we have in Google, in, including Google Safe Browse, by the way. Um, so it really just motivates that importance that you can't even you can't detect an attack if you can't see it in the first place. Well, it's probably a human gap, right? Like that five day gap is is humans finding out about it, you know, analyzing it manually and and going back to market. Well, we also uh, there's also cases in the threat report where uh, you can check the URL two months later, and it just never gets discovered um, because. Mm it has an activate switch and it has a turn on switch, a turn off switch, and you deliver the payload to the user that you want. And once you get what you need, you turn it off. And oh, gotcha. there's no, uh, no one's gonna be able to access that payload once it's turned off. So I think that's also part of the problem as well. So they're doing that on the web server or with the link itself, you know, some, some proxy or redirect component? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can do it based on the request time. 
So I'm going to deliver a phishing attack, but it's not going to be active at the time of delivery. So it's going to get into the inbox and get undetected. I'm going to activate it at a very specific time. And if the IP that's making the request is from some IP address that's outside of a range that I that I want, um, I'm going to redirect it to um, anything I want. I'm going to show I'm going to show those those requests what I want them to see, but I'm only going to deliver the phishing attack to that IP address or range of IP addresses that I'm I'm targeting. Um, so I think that the problem is is that uh, you know once the hackers achieve their objective, uh, it's very easy for them to deactivate the attack or simply redirect all incoming requests. Um, so I think that's also part of the problem is it's just very, from a forensic perspective, it's very difficult uh, to figure out what was on that server being served to a particular user at a particular time. Um, so that's really why we're trying to make browsers smarter uh, so that these kinds of attacks don't happen in the future. Chris, awesome stuff. Um, you can find the threat report as well as uh, subscribe to a free. Is it a try? It just explain how it's delivered to both end users and, and enterprises, Chris, before we conclude. Absolutely. So business users can sign up for a free phishing actualization test. So you can actually deploy Pixum to your work devices and have users enroll on their uh, personal devices. And you can actually observe fish, real phishing attacks that are getting detected and getting stopped that are making it past your, your gaps in your security funnel. So we offer this uh, for a free period so that you can actually observe your phishing gaps directly. You can get that directly from our website mm -hmm. at pixum.net or by going to, you can get a special deal, of course, going to securityweekly.com forward slash P-I-X-M Pixum. Chris, thank you so much for appearing on Enterprise Security Weekly today. Yeah, Paul, it was a pleasure. Tyler, Adrian, thank you very much. With that, we're stick around. We're going to talk with Jeff Foley coming up next. Stay tuned.